Welcome to the start of day two of the Jeju Forum for Peace and Prosperity. We, it is the uh, beginning of plenary session one. Let me just repeat myself. Um, all of you are well aware, but please turn your mobile phones to silent mode. Um, we are strictly adhering to government's uh, guidelines to keep everyone safe from COVID-19. So please keep your face masks on at all times. And that includes people that will be on the stage speaking. Um, and we have simultaneous translation all throughout the day, especially in the morning sessions. Um, the trans if you look at your translation receivers, channel one is Korean, channel two is English, and we have channel three in French. Uh, so that concludes um, our housekeeping notes. Good morning, my name is Son Jie, professor at Iwa Women's University. I will be emceeing your morning this morning. Um, for plenary session one, we will be held under the theme of cooperation and leadership to address climate change in the pandemic era. Very timely uh, topic. Um, to moderate this session is my good friend and a, a, a Jeju lover himself, um, Mr. Kim sang Hyup, the president of Jeju Research Institute. Uh, he will moderate the session. Let's wake ourselves up and give him a warm round of applause to welcome him onto the stage. President Kim. Welcome, President Kim. And with this, I actually going to hand you the mic and the role of the moderator for now. Um, President Kim. Thank you, Professor Sun. Uh, well, good uh, morning, everyone. It is my uh, great, great honor uh, to moderate the opening plenary session with the great leaders of the world on the topic of climate crisis and the forthcoming new global climate regime. Well, as you remember well, the world has agreed, reached the climate change agreement in Paris in the year 2015. Now six years have passed and this year would be the year of another great momentum as we are going to finalize the rule books or individual implementing implementation law if we regard the Paris climate change as the uh, constitution of the international community. It is uh, very difficult to finalize the task but we have another great momentum because we have new leader of the world, the United States praise president, Joe Biden. And he is, he is moving agenda to the heart of the world. Well, having said that, we have a great speakers who couldn't be better. Firstly, uh, the former president of France, Mr. Francois Hollande, is with us. One of the real maker of the Paris Agreement. And we have the former uh, head of the United Nations for 10 years, who is the architect of the Paris Agreement. And also we have uh, great climate champions representing the United States and Korea who are Jay Inslee, the Washington governor of America and Won Hyeryeong, the Jeju governor. Thank you all indeed for joining us. And uh, before we have a panel discussion, I'd like to have the privilege to have the opportunity to hear from 
President Francois Hollande. This is the first time for Jeju Forum to have this kind of top-notch telepresence hologram communication. Please welcome me joining uh, Mr. President Orland with big round of applause. Thank you. I'm very pleased to be part of this forum. Before getting started, first of all, I would like to cover how France prepare for the uh, COP21. Uh, through the COP21, we mobilized, we mobilized uh, all different states and countries, and we are able to set the goal. Uh, first of all, let me cover history first. The Copenhagen uh, conference was a failure. It created a great disturbance in the world. Disturbance in the world. A lot of countries came forward to host the COP21, uh, but this uh, confusion made it more difficult. At the time, as the president of France, we decided to take the risk and host the COP21. By doing so. We try to make up for the failure uh, we have seen in the uh, Copenhagen. We also had a high risk of failure because China and the United States did not want to change the way they spend and the way they produce things. And energy producing countries did not want to reduce the uh, fossil fuel use for their industry, and some states with the uh, with the conventional power generation did not want to close the uh, power plants. And developing countries have their own concern too, because the the uh, climate goal would uh, hinder their economic development. My approach was to work with my ministers for the sake of the world. By doing so, we, I was able to confirm that we are on the same line with other countries. At that time, I was helped greatly by Mr. Nicola Wallou. He is the uh, expert in climate change. And as a president, I visited a lot of countries around the world. And I had the discussions with the different countries and tried to mobilize and collect the will to reach the goal in the uh, Paris uh, conference. And with the United States President and the Chinese Prime Minister Xi Jinping, I, uh, try, I tried to make, uh, uh, make the best to see the productive outcome uh, from this effort. And I got great help from the uh, UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. Uh, and I also wanted that the European continent should be able to set the goal for uh, carbon neutrality. I hope all the European countries stand ready uh, for this new goal. And so this will has been expressed in our European gathering. And another thing that I wanted to have is that the African countries, the most uh, the least developed countries to be part of this Paris conference. So I asked them to set the goal for the future by curving, reduce, uh, by curving energy consumption and diversify economy. And we created a fund to help them in the amount of $1 trillion. So we com made a commitment to help them uh, to survive in the future. So we took a step to reach the uh, consensus 
During the COP21 conference, I really wanted to minimize the risks. At that time, I had the uh, Foreign Affairs Minister, Mr. Lorang Pavius. We listed up uh, the, uh, the candidate uh, points of consensus, and every bullet point should be agreed by the member countries even before the start of the conference. So, I want to deliver uh, this advice to the potential COP, COP host. You don't really have to try to uh, tackle all the difficult tasks. It's already right. So basic framework should be agreed even before uh, the signing the convention in the COP conferences. So during the conferences, you have to focus on the small things to be agreed. Otherwise, you cannot reach consensus. If you try to find a consensus one day before the signing, it will be the surest way to failure. That's how the COP21 in Paris was successful. And all the stakeholders, uh, com international communities came together uh, to set the goal. And we also had a strong support from the civil society, which is very important. Governments and states are the primary actors. Once they set the goal and they took they take the responsibility for the implementation. However, if you want to go further than that, then you have to involve the actors from the civil society, local governments, major cities, and labor unions. They are all important actors. And also the role of the young people is important. They are sensitive, they are passionate, and they have a great interest in the future of the earth in terms of climate change. All these different wishes and interests were, were reflected in the colloquium. In, we have to open the door for civil society to reach the uh, government. And the other important stakeholder is large corporations. In a sense, The multinational companies would be concerned only about their business. That was true in the past, but not anymore. Today, consumers and employees of large companies have a great power to move the change. And in the financial sector, if you look at the large, com large banks, when they extend the loan, they consider the uh, environmental friendliness. Last thing I want to emphasize is this. How c should we maintain the international commitment? In order to do so, we have to check whether countries reach this goal. So in this role of the UN and UN agencies, it's very important. Whenever COP conferences are held, the goals set by the companies and commitment made by uh, countries are delivered. If the delivery is failed, then the, they should be supported to reach the goal. We, we made a lot of efforts. Nevertheless, the goal of Paris Agreement is far from to be rigid. If we just maintain the goal of the Paris Agreement, if we not go further than that, and if we don't, if do, if we don't ask the uh, international community to do more, it will be we it will be uh, un insufficient. We will be we will fail to reach the uh, less than two Celsius degree rise. So we have to set the new goal, new ambitious goals. So we have to double check whether those uh, goals have been met or not. Personally, I have this kind of experiences. For example, we signed on the Paris Agreement despite the concerns and disappointments expressed by many stakeholders. 
So for taking this opportunity, I would like to say thank you to the President Biden for returning to the table. Uh, COP21, 26 will be held in Glasgow, the UK. The day will be very, very important. With all, uh, with all efforts, we will try to reach the goal and go beyond. The civil society uh, should be rest should rest assured about the efforts by the uh, state and government actors. That is called multilateralism. Multilateralism was threatened by uh, President Trump. Now we are returning to the multilateralism, and we involve international community, and we revisit international agreement. That will be how we we win the trust about uh, the democracy and we get uh, support from the private sector. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. President. He really seems to be here with us. I think that is the power of technology. Um, truly, we are all connected. And as uh, President uh, Oland emphasized, this year is for real action, climate action. And we are going to have a COP26, which is Conference of Parties in Glasgow, UK. And that final deal should be made for really ambitious climate action. Thank you for the message. And now I'd like to have the honor to invite Honorable Mr. Ban Ki-moon, who used to run the UN for 10 years and now as the chairman of the Global Green Growth Institute. I'd like to have him on the stage to listen to the uh, open remark for this important session. Please joining me, uh, welcoming. Thank you, Professor Kim sang yap for your very kind introduction and monitoring. Honorable Won Hiryong, Governor of Jeju Self-Governing uh, Province. His Excellency Francois Hollande, the 24th the President of France. Honorable Jay Inslee, Governor of the State of Washington, United States. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, and particular excellencies, ambassadors joining this place. It is my great honor and privilege to speak to you today in today's plenary session one at the Jeju Forum 2021. Thank you for having me here today. I'm proud to join the other distinguished panelists as we are collectively striving to boost international cooperation and leadership to address climate change in the pandemic era. As the COVID-19 pandemic carries on into the second year and captures the international community's attention, climate change is continuing to usher in dire risks and elevated instability. Indeed, our planet is on fire, both literally and figuratively, with the climate crisis accelerating as temperatures surge, glaciers melt, sea levels rise, and wildfires burn. Despite dropping by around 6% in 2020, as much of the global population stayed home and industries shuttered, CO2 levels once again reached historic levels averaging 419 ppm in May, according to NOAA, U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. At the same time, the five hottest years 
of globally recorded temperatures have now all occurred since 2015. With this in mind, we simply must increase our collective efforts to protect ourselves, our communities, and our world from the existential threats this will bring. The only way we can holistically do this is by coming together through multilateral cooperation and elevated global leadership to take urgent climate action. Indeed, both pandemics and climate change are inherently global issues, which requires a strong multilateral response and increased international cooperation and partnership. Global leadership was lacking last year when the pandemic began with multilateralism in a state of disarray and great power competition hindering cooperation when we truly need it. Learning the lessons from the pandemic, leaders must do better in their common response to the climate crisis. I am of the view that COVID-19 has also offered us a glimpse of the possible global disruptions that could arise from climate change in the near future. These include, but are not limited to, elevated public health perils, migration, turmoil to supply chains, increased conflict, heightened risks for insurance and index, index funds, and protracted economic crisis. So we must immediately raise our ambition and urgency to take necessary steps to both mitigate and adapt to climate change and turn existing international commitments into decisive and transformational actions. During my 10 years as Secretary General of the United Nations, I am proud to have prioritized climate change and elevated its importance to the very top of the international agenda. The Paris Agreement, signed by 195 state parties in, 20, in December 2015, offers us clear game plan to confront the serious threats to our planet. It sets viable targets to impede rising temperatures, constrict greenhouse gas emissions, and spur climate resilient development and green growth. In this regard, I pay my high, highest respect and support to Pr President Hollande of France for his strong leadership for climate action. We have spent many days and nights and we worked very closely. I will have some more stories to tell when I'm sitting in other panel discussions. I believe that the Paris Agreement offers us our best hope to persevere over the serious threats to our planet, but we must urgently step up implementation efforts. We don't have a plan B because we don't have a planet B either. And quite frankly, we have no time to spare. Indeed, recent UN climate change report paints a worrying picture of fast approaching environmental tipping points, surging global heating, oceanic threats, and seismic biodiversity loss if urgent climate action is not taken uh, to cut emissions by 50% in order to restrict the planet's temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, in order to faithfully implement the Paris Agreement and push it further, countries need to expand their ambitions and urgency to cut emissions. And we must secure increased climate financing from upper income nations and through the catalyzing power of cooperation and partnerships. 
This is particularly critical in the lead up to COP26 in Glasgow, United Kingdom, where the climate rule book will be finalized and codified. In this regard, I commend the recent G7 summit leaders for their recent commitment to reaching net zero emissions by 2050. Now, global leaders must go further by expanding climate funding for de developing nations and scaling up financing for climate adaptation to ensure that COP26 is a great success for humanity. The fate of the health, security, and well-being of our planet and humanity is in our hands. So let us choose wisely. Let us work together to make this planet Earth and our humanity can live peacefully and sustainably and healthy. Thank you for your attention and leadership and for your action. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Ban. Uh, as Chairman Ban pointed out, we are seeing the planetary tipping point is coming to us without actions. We are not just able to escape from that planetary tipping point. Now let us have a panel session. And uh, Governor Wan Hiryang to the stage. Please uh, join me welcoming the two leaders to the stage. Chairman Ban, uh, let me just briefly go back to the past six years ago, 2015. I was there in Paris, and I, I am the witness when you that made that dramatic Paris Agreement happen. Before we begin a panel discussion, you are with uh, another maker, another architect of the Paris Agreement with, uh, with President Hollande. So could you tell us briefly some episode behind the curtain? If I really going to say episode, there are so many things, so many failures, frustrations, so many successes. So it may take a long time, but just to make a short uh, stories, which really made everyone's heart sink, sink. That was during the last moment, just before, few minutes before gaveling this uh, hard fought, hard negotiated climate change agreement on December 12th, 2015. Everybody was a very happy mood. President Hollande and myself, uh, Roland Fabius, John Kerry, Angela Merkel. There were 150 heads of state and government, including President Obama, President Xi Jinping, etc. So everybody was waiting just to be gaveled because by that time, after nine years of hard negotiations, everybody agreed. Then suddenly, suddenly, one small Latin American country indicated that they cannot support this one. The decision-making rules is very strange. Then all the 195 member states must sign, must agree. It's not the it's not normal procedures. It's, a, it's an absolute unanimity, 100% unanimity. Then this country just indicated that, you know, my president is not supporting this one. Really, my heart sank, and President Hollande, and everybody. Then we all went to him. He was not head of state. 
Minister of Environment from Nicaragua, a small country. Then President Hollande and I, you know, everybody was just uh, trying to really break his neck, you know, just, uh, just to keep in silence, but we couldn't do. We are just a gentle, a gentle delegation. Then we were not successful. Then President Hollande and I decided to uh, reach out two most important persons. I, to Nicaraguan President Ortega, former Sandinista, President Hollande to uh, Pope Francis, because Pope Francis has been extremely supportive. So we just went to our office and tried to um, reach an agreement, I, I mean, tell their support, get their support. But my telephone was not being reached to President Ortega, just that there was a repeated recording, recording in Spanish, which I couldn't understand. President Hollande either was not able to speak to um, Pope Francis, maybe he must have been at the time praying for, praying for this uh, adoption of the climate change. And then suddenly, this Minister Kelly of Environment of Nicaragua wanted to meet me. So I couldn't meet anybody at that time, so he came to my office. His condition was very simple. Look, I spoke to my president. My president is willing to support this Paris Agreement if you come to Nicaragua for the second visit. I had already visited Nicaragua. Then he wanted me to come before Christmas time. I could do much more than that at that time. I could visit 100 times. So I said, okay, I promise. Then there was an agreement. So I just, my staff informed Roland Fabius. Of course, it was gaveled. At the moment of gaveling this adoption, I and President Hollande were in our offices. So we were just running. It was about 60, 70 meters away. So we were running. I saw everybody was jump, jumping, dancing, embracing, clapping. It was a hugely, hugely successful and joyous mood. And then we all held our hands high together. That was the picture, very historic picture, which you see. Now then what happened? I wanted to visit Nicaragua for the second time. And then my staff were absolutely against. You must not go. So I owe him a big, big things now. Even, you know, I'm willing now to uh, visit in my personal capacity. This is very historic episode. Then another, Another important, either important but frustrating one was ha happened in 2009 in Copenhagen, COP15. Uh, that was my first and the last frustrating diplomatic failure. By 2009, the United Nations was already working very hard and campaigning for seal the deal, seal the deal in Copenhagen. United States, China, United States, Japan, and European Union have publicly stated that we'll provide $100 billion by 2020, and thereafter, 2021, and thereafter, $100 billion, just to make sure that developing countries would be on board that was a big promise, which has not yet been felt, I mean, kept. Then somehow the world was completely divided by, between developing and developed countries. China was not on board. India was not on board. It was only United States and European Union and some countries like Korea, Japan, and some countries. India was not on board. 
there was total failure. There was not a single agreement. That is my, I think, deepest, most embarrassing diplomatic failure. But then on, there, thereafter, we worked very hard until December, December 12, 2015 in Paris. That's uh, one of the episodic, episodic things. But we must not repeat this kind of things. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I really wish I could hear more, but these are the things that should be written in the history of all humankind afterwards. So valuable uh, lessons we have learned from you and uh, President Orland. So uh, President Orland, good evening there. Do you see us? I, at, It must be actually it is uh, 2 a.m. midnight. So I must say good midnight there, Mr. President. How are you? Thank you. Thank you for inviting me for the first, first time. First. And also, I'd like to say thank you uh, to Mr. Pan Kim for a great contribution to COP21. And with the Secretary General Pan Kim, for the Nicaragua issue, uh, we were able to pull off the consensus with uh, Mr. Laurent Fabius. And also, I would like to say great gratitude to Governor Wan Hiryong And I hope that the Jeju Forum will be one stepping stone for the COP26. Uh, COP26 is very important because it will mark uh, one great stride toward the completion of a Paris Agreement. Mr. Jay Inslee, the governor of Washington State of America, is with us. Good afternoon there. Good morning. <laughs> Here. He really speaks good Korean. <laughs> well, as you, you uh, <clears throat> are demonstrating not just national level, but also sub-national efforts uh, for climate change is really, really critical for our audience. I know you are the climate champion, not just for your state, but also for the United States. Can you share your story briefly about the efforts? And your state is known as an evergreen state, and you make it ever more green, as I understand. Please share your story with us for briefly. Yes, first off, it's an honor to join the Secretary General, the President, Governor Wan, who, by the way, has been a tremendous leader. His leadership goes across the Pacific Ocean. It inspires us around the world. My story is a state that is the home of Microsoft, Amazon, uh, Boeing, and it is also the state in the United States, of course, we're in the northwest corner of the United States, that has the most robust, uh, ambitious, comprehensive climate change policies in the United States. We're proud of that, and we think it's a pivotal moment for states to be able to tell their stories on the international stage. And one of the things that Governor Juan and I have talked about is that we are most hopeful that governors and mayors at COP26 can really come together to bring a second uh, punch, if you will, against climate change. And that is by states and cities and counties and precincts that really can be not subnationals, but in some sense, supranationals. We, we think of ourselves as supranationals because we can be more flexible on occasion than national governments. We can be faster on occasion than national governments. And we can be more ambi ambitious because of our political circumstances frequently than national governments. 
So what is happening in my state, I believe can re be replicated across the world, which is in my state, we have a 100% clean requirement for 100% clean electricity, carbon neutrality by 2030 and total decarbonization by 2045. We have one of the, we have the best cap and invest system in the United States. We have a new clean fuel standard now and the most uh, efficient building standards. These are things that we hope at the COP26 in Glasgow that we can call all of the governors and mayors of the world to come together to, to add an entirely new level of quantum energy to the COP process. Because what we have done in our state, we think we can do in states and provinces around the world to do things even in advance, more ambitious, more speedy, more innovative, even than national governments. And I think my state is one example, and I can't, I'm so excited to join Governor Wong uh, in Glasgow in that regard. Thank you. Uh... So, Governor Wan, you have waited for a long time, and for Governor Wan, um, he went to the Paris uh, COP26 meeting representing Korea, and he also attended the the climate summit that was held recently representing the uh, local government of Korea. And there was also World Resource Institute hosted event. And I know that you had the chance to meet with Governor Jay Inslee to have discussion about the Green Industry Alliance. So together with the efforts from Jeju Island, I uh, want to hear what you think about this kind of um, cooperation and alliance efforts. I'm um, nice to meet you, Governor um, Inslee, at P4G meeting. Um, you have shown us the picture of reindeer from your state, and I showed you the picture of Hala Mountain. So we talked about the necessity for climate action and to have the alliance. Well, between the U.S. and Korea, we have the military alliance, but between the state of Washington and um, Jeju Island, we should have this kind of a climate alliance. By 2030, Washington stated that for the power generation, you are going to convert all the power generation to green energy, and by 2040, all the industries will be consuming just green energy. That was your statement, and it was also put into the law. And by 2030, Jeju Island is also aiming to be carbon free. So I think that our goals are in line, very similar. I could feel that we are going for the same target. By 2030, at Jeju Island, we are going to convert all the power generation and all vehicles on the island to green energy. For that, we are going to ban the registration of new cars that are using internal combustion engine from being registered in the island. So our efforts are like the champions in the climate. And in that regard, uh, well, at Glasgow, I know that uh, Governor Inslee is going to attend um, the COP26 meeting and make strong uh, statements about the uh, climate action. And we also have um, other important figures here. And I would not be able to attend COP26, but I'm sure that um, Governor Inslee is going to uh, show the importance of various alliances that are needed amongst cities and states to put the impetus on the climate action. Thank you. Able to see the birds, uh, between the U.S. and Korea in some sense. <coughs> well, uh, 
I'm afraid our time is running very rapidly. Uh, so, uh, well, as we would all agree, and as we have uh, the UK ambassador to Korea, Simon Smith, the COP26 that will be held in November, Glasgow, is really, really, really important. So what must be done for the success of the COP26 and the new global climate regime? I must ask you directly to Chairman Ban, what would be the real critical task? Each and every COP during last uh, uh, 20, 25 years has had some uh, successes and failures and expectations and uh, disappointment. So that is the history of negotiation of uh, climate change. In my mind, to my mind, there, is no, there has been no such a COP summit than COP26 in Glasgow. Of course, we can regard the Paris COP was the high climax. There are three things which I expect from COP26. First of all, the international community must have a fully codified rule book according to this climate change agreement. Without rule book, without rule book, in fact, because this year is the first year beginning to implement the Paris Climate Change Agreement. So we must start well and perfectly. So rule book is very much important. Second, as the G7 leaders in the United Kingdom recently have reaffirmed their strong political support to provide $100 billion to developing countries for their mitigation and adaptation actions, there must be a very clear-cut roadmap how they are going to mobilize $100 billion. G7 leaders, they just spoke in general terms that we will provide. But this kind of uh, promise in words have been done since 2009. From 2009 to 2020, they were able to mobilize only $80 billion. $80 billion. Now, the promise is that from this year, every year, without definite the period, every year they have to provide $100 billion. That includes richest countries, and well-to-do countries, OECD member countries, including Republic of Korea, my country, they have to mobilize and provide the science and technological support to many developing countries. It is morally wrong if those developing countries who have not contributed too much to this climate phenomenon should be bear blunt of all these catastrophic consequences. Now, many countries, they can do it. They can mitigate, they can adapt. But simply, developing countries, they do not have any capacity. So that's the number two. Third, there should be much, much heightened political will. Political will. We have seen such kind of uh, phenomena all throughout our hu human history. When there are promises, these promises must be kept by the political leaders. It's not only political leaders, business leaders too. Therefore, there should be much, much heightened political will at the leaders level. At the, this is what the, they have spoken out in the G7 summit meeting. Therefore, United Kingdom, I think you have Ambassador Simon Smith, your country has historical, historical responsibility to make sure that as chairman of COP26, make sure that all these promises are felt. 
We are living in a 21st century where science and technology are all time high available to all of us. But this should be, this should be shared by whole country of international community. We have no time to, to wait. The situation is a dire. The glaciers are melting, sea level is rising. The IPCC has announced that we have to keep our global temperature rise below 1.5 degrees Celsius. Now, WMO, World Meteorological Organization of the United Nations, already confirmed that we have consumed 1.2 degrees already. We have just 0.3 degrees Celsius. So we have no time to waste. So let us work together with all our resources, political will, pulling together to make this world healthier and sustainable way for our succeeding generation. I think this is our moral and political responsibility living in this era. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Oh, we are almost, um, but uh, we must uh, have an have, have a opportunity for three of us, three of the speakers to share the messages. So uh, President Orland, uh, what should be done? What should be done for the uh, two, uh, COP26? But briefly, please. C'est-à-dire depuis la conclusion de la COP21, il y a eu. Grâce à la décision de M. Biden. So, together with the Biden administration, well, we can see that the U.S. is back in the Paris Agreement. Many governments should act together to make the new regime possible. And we recently had the climate risk. Uh, we recently had the pandemic, and that made many governments awaken to the dire reality. Many projects are being implemented for carbon neutrality and for the funding while well, it's being raised. In recent few years, we could see the carbon emission dropping. And all these uh, situations tell us that the climate change is a serious uh, issue. So NDC should be reaffirmed. The NDC that was signed at the Paris Agreement should be reaffirmed. And we are putting a lot of efforts to put the NDC into action. So I'm sure that if we don't take the proper action, then we will see the climate temperature going up by more than 2%. So first thing we need to do before the Glasgow summit is that we each country should enhance their NDC that was set in 2015. The second target is related to the carbon neutrality. By 2050, we have to go carbon neutral And when we say carbon neutral, well, each country and each continent should have their own target. And as formal Secretary General Ban Ki-moon said, there should be various uh, additional supports to developing countries. Those are my three comments. Thank you very much. We must come up with enhanced nationally determined contribution. That's what we need most. Thank you for the message. 
And uh, Governor Inslee, you are building up a coalition of subnational leaders, and you will be having something at, at in Glasgow. Tell me your strategy, but briefly, please. I think uh, we have lost your voice. Uh, governor, Governor, uh, please uh, check uh, your audio. So we have lost your voice. Yes, please. We're, yes, first off, we're going to invent a way to remind us to unmute ourselves internationally. That's our first goal uh, for COP26. What I was saying is we have to ignite uh, and use every renewable resources we have. And we have an enormous renewable resource that we're not utilizing adequately in this na international effort. And that is states, provinces, cities, counties, mayors, governors. We have to get them into the game. And that's why it is my hope that we will have a, a conclave and a, uh, a meeting Okay. where we will inspire each other, set goals that can be even more ambitious ambitious than nation states. And we can ourselves reach uh, uh, agreements amongst ourselves to be more ambitious, to be more direct, to be more innovative, because we can do that in many cases that are uh, not inconsistent with our national goals, but on occasion can be more, uh, more rapid. Okay. So that is our effort at, at COP26. Uh, we have equal fervor, equal passion, and frequently more equal thing to actually move the ball to implement these rule books that the Secretary General talked about. So that is our intention. We are talking to governors and mayors across uh, the world. I, I am confident we're going to be a, a real force in Glasgow, and none too soon because of the things we know okay. we have to do. Thank you for your super national efforts. And the <laughs> low carbon energy transition throughout the world is most essential. And that's what uh, Washington and that's what Jeju is doing. 자, 지사님 마지막으로 지금 탄소 중립 2050년이라는 건 Governor Wan, carbon neutrality 2050. Well, we have 30 years. So it means that those in their 20s and 30s will be um, the main leaders of 2050. And there are some people saying that the opinions of these uh, young people should be reflected in the future policies. What do you think about that? Yes the main victims of the climate change would be the young people of today. So the young people should be able to make their voice in our policy so that they can take the lead in implementing those policies. So I think that we should give them more opportunities to uh, voice their opinion and reflect them in our policy making. Thank you. Do you see uh, the from Korean morning to Washington afternoon and to Paris midnight, we have been all connected, interconnected, then that's what we need and we must, must cooperate for this important task. Thank you for being with us. This is the conclusion of this session. Thank you, Mr. Kim. Thank you, Mr. Kim. Um, it was a very, uh, we identified some very important goals for climate action. Uh, before we, we let you go, um, we want to, you know, we live in a visual world. And so the Jeju Forum has prepared a special event. Um, we have what um, a, we have invited someone called a visual thinking director. Um, he has sort of made a one um, sheet. Sh one page of uh, all the all the thoughts that were um, uh, pronounced during this session and he encapsulated into one screen. So we thought we would um, introduce you to the screen that he wrote, that he's right on the side, that he sort of put together while everyone was speaking. I'm sure it will be shared um, with everyone afterwards. So if you want to just co come back and if you've forgotten what those important messages were, um, here they are. So, um, and I think we'll have them translated into English as well. So, um, 
on yes on on that note um i am going to um thank everybody everyone on stage once again and uh and then we will close this session thank you very much now after this session is the opening ceremony um we are not taking a break we're actually just taking a what we call maybe a pause a slight pause so that we can reset the stage and we'll start right away so please remain seated thank you